Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, we are still in 2 Corinthians, now in chapter 6. We left out of chapter 5 last week. So now let's do a little recap on chapter 5 from last session. In chapter 5, Paul completes the comparison of the ministry between Christians and Moses. He does so to enable us to understand and appreciate the glory of our ministry and its superiority over that of the Mosaic economy. Paul continues the theme of life amid death and glory following as a result of present suffering. Some may ask about the believer who dies before he has followed God faithfully for very long. Will such a person experience no glory in the future? Paul explains that all Christians who die will receive an immortal body. This by itself is a, is a substantial gift of glory. Christians, including those who die soon after becoming believers, possess the Holy Spirit, who is God's pledge, his security deposit of our complete glorification Death begins a new phase of existence for all believers that will be far superior to what we experience now. Paul claims that his earnest desire is not for death and for the disembodied state that goes with it, but rather for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the present time, we are redeemed as to our spirit and soul but then redemption will include the body as well. If you can bring your mind to grasp it, God made us with this goal in view, the glorified state, the redemption of the body, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is the climax of his glorious purpose for us. The believer should make it his aim to be well-pleasing to the Lord. While his salvation is not dependent on works, his reward in a coming day will be directly proportionate to his faithfulness to the Lord. A believer should always remember that faith is linked with salvation and works are linked with reward. He is saved by grace through faith, not of works. But once he is saved, he should be ambitious to perform good works and for so doing he will receive rewards. And every one of y'all right now are doing good works. You're sitting here and learning about your Lord and Savior. Amen. Our love of the truth and a healthy sense of accountability to God should move us to fulfill our calling. We know that our life is an open book to God. All those who by faith enter into the benefits of, of Christ's sacrifice and now live spiritually should respond by living selflessly and being involved in the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry, this ministry, makes us God's ambassadors who confidently announce his message to others and request not demand, acceptance. The Christian ambassador announces and appeals for God. When we preach, those who hear should hear a voice from God a voice which speaks on behalf of Christ in whom God is reconciling the world. What a blessed truth it is that the one who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we who knew no righteousness might become the righteousness of God in him. The effect of God imputing righteousness to believers is that now God sees us as he sees his righteous son, namely, fully acceptable to him. No mortal tongue will ever be able to thank God sufficiently for, the, for such boundless grace. Picking up from the end of last session, King James Version, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 through 21. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, to wit, a legal term, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, 
and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech by us. We pray in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. This is another one of them chapters I like. I like all the chapters. Exposition of Paul's view of the ministry. This is the last part of his exposition in chapter 6. Paul here completes the explanation of his view of Christian ministry, so we will appreciate and adopt his viewpoint and not lose heart. Chapter 6, verse 1. We then, workers, together, beseech also that you receive, receive not the grace of God in vain. Do not receive God's grace in vain. For he said, God said, I have heard you in a time accepted. And the word accepted there means opportune, an opportune time. And in the day of salvation have I succored you, aided you. That's what succored means. Behold, now is the accepted or favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul went back to Isaiah 49, 8 and pulled out what God was telling the Jews back in Isaiah's day. The, uh, the prophetic words that Isaiah was giving out for he said, I have heard you in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have I succored or aided you. And what Paul is saying, behold, now is the accepted or favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What Isaiah was pro prophesying about was the coming of Jesus. Well, that's happened. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all, everything, approving, here meaning commending ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, long suffering, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments and tumults and labors, in watchings and in fastings. He's saying these are all the things that we go through, the afflictions, but we have to be in much patience, long suffering in the afflictions, going through the necessities and distresses, helping out our fellows that have stripes laid on them, those that are imprisoned, those that are going through tumults, those that are laboring, we, consider, we continue to help those that are in the labor for God. In watchings, we watch everything that's going on, being watchmen, in fastings. Then he goes, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering. We do all those things that he just mentioned by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost. We do everything with the leading of the Holy Ghost. By love unfeigned, no fake love here. By the word of truth, the gospel, by the power of God, by the armor, and the armor here doesn't mean the armor that you wear, it's talking about the weapons of your warfare. It's talking about weapons, by the weapons of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor, now he gets into what it is that's a paradox for all Christians. By honor and dishonor by evil report and good report, because they're going to do everything they can to dishonor you, they're going to do everything they can to give evil report on you, but those who love you will continue to give good report as deceivers, because you'll be said to be a deceiver when you're speaking about Jesus Christ. Yet true, because when you're speaking the word of God and you're taking it directly out of the word of God that you're speaking, then you're true, regardless of how much they say you're being deceptive. As unknown, yet well known. I'm unknown, I don't need to be known, yet well known as Christ. As dying, and behold, we live. As chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Is everybody always rejoicing, even in the sorrow? We need to be. 
because that shows us that we are the Christians out here. We rejoice even in sorrow, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. I hope y'all are getting very wealthy off all this word that you're getting, all this training as having nothing and yet possessing all things. People may look at you and go, well, you haven't got anything. I got news for you. I've got everything because God is the one who gives it all to me and I don't need the things of this world because I've got something in the future much better. Believers receive God's grace when they hear and receive the gospel message. Now Paul urges them to respond to it so God's gracious bestowal will not have been in vain. God gives grace to all people throughout their lives, but he gives more grace at that moment of conversion. Paul has in mind the grace received at conversion and the subsequent continual grace and spoke generally of proper response to divine grace. Receiving God's grace in vain would be not allowing it to have its divinely intended result in our lives. To view God's grace as having little or no value, receiving it in vain. For too many teach a valueless gospel and far too many receive it. The gospel has a great value to it. It is who Jesus Christ is. It is who God is. And he makes it clear, everything I say is only what I hear my father say. And so if he's only saying what his father said, then I'm saying what his father said because everything I am going to teach you comes straight out of God's word and nowhere else. To view God's grace as having little or no value is receiving it in vain. There are many who don't receive the grace properly and they're constantly running back to the cross to get forgiveness for what they've already got forgiveness for when they accepted Jesus Christ. That is where the devil wants you. That is where Satan, the destroyer, wants to keep you. Because if you move on from the cross and start becoming a strong and mature Christian, then you're defeating everything that he's trying to do in this earth. And you start representing something that is a great threat to him. And when you become a great threat to him, he comes after you harder. And he comes after you harder. And he does everything in his power to turn you off the path and turn you back toward just going back to the cross. If, if he can get at least you to do that and think that you're nothing and that you've got to be back there at the cross hugging it, begging forgiveness when Christ has already forgiven you. He wants you to walk in that forgiveness. We don't go seeking to sin. We know that sinful life is all around us regardless. So we continue to walk in the forgiveness that God has for us in becoming strong Christians and starting to tell the public out there how great and wonderful our God is. As he begs, as Paul begs unbelievers to receive God's reconciling grace, Paul now urges them to respond quickly and positively to God's grace to them. Paul quotes Isaiah 49, 8 to stress the importance of responding immediately. The opportunity will not last forever. In the context of the quote, God is addressing his servant. And this is talking about in Isaiah. He is addressing his servant whom the nations despise, promising eventual vindication and urging him, his servant, to restore his people. The servant, of course, is prophesied as Jesus. The parallel with Paul and his ministry is obvious. They are constantly coming after him to destroy everything that he is and destroy his ministry. Rather than squabbling among themselves, they needed to get on with the ambassadorial work that God gave them to do, which is what he was trying to tell the Jews to do, but they would not do it. In his preaching of the gospel, Paul seizes upon this marvelous truth and announces to unsaved listeners, Behold, now is the favor time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In other words, the era of which Isaiah prophesied as the day of salvation has already come. So Paul urges men to trust the Savior while it is still the day of salvation. 
when the church is pulled up off of this earth, there will be 144,000 young Jewish men that are going to be put out on this earth during the seven-year tribulation. And they'll only be there for the first three and a half years of it. And all the people that get saved during that time have salvation and will be pulled off of this earth. And then the last three and a half years will be pure hell on earth. And salvation will not get you off of this earth, but it will keep you from going to hell. Ah, they need to do it while there is still time. The Corinthians should not, and Paul tried not to give any cause for others to stumble because of their ministry. Obviously, it is impossible to prevent all criticism of our ministry because there will be some who take offense without good reason. We should do everything we can to make sure we do not give anyone cause for justifiable criticism. Paul realizes that there are always those who are looking for an excuse not to listen to the message of salvation. And if they can find that excuse in the inconsistent life of the preacher, so much the better. As pointed out previously, the ministry here does not refer to some dignified ecclesiastical office, but rather to the service of Christ, which belongs to all who are in Christ. Hello, young lady. Paul proceeds to describe positively how he conducted himself to prove that his own reception of God's grace is not in vain. He commends and defends his ministry to provide the faithful with more ammunition to rebut his critics. Note that he refers to his actions rather than his words. He cites three groups of trials, and there are three kinds of trials in each group. These he prefaced with a claim to patience, which means steadfast endurance, an important quality in an ambassador of Christ. All afflictions are calculated to move you from any pathway of steadfastness in Christ. Verses 4 and 5 describe the physical sufferings endured. 6 and 7 have to do with the Christian graces exhibited, and 8 through 10 list the contrasting experiences which are so typical of the Christian ministry. And Paul names various graces, positive character qualities that God produces mainly in, the, in and through these trials. Paul now moves from the external circumstances, all the sufferings that are going on to internal qualities. Pureness, which means singleness of mind as well as moral uprightness. Knowledge or understanding includes understanding of Christian faith, insight, and sensitivity to God's will. Of course, First and foremost, knowledge means knowing God's word. Long-suffering is patience with difficult people without retaliation. Kindness reflects a generous and sympathetic disposition that manifests itself in good actions. The Holy Spirit means that all is done in the Spirit's power and in subjection to him. Genuine love is the honest desire to do what is best for those in view Genuine love means truth. Everything that you do will always be done in truth according to the word of God. The word of truth is honest ministry, consistent with the type of message preached. The power of God is the power that God manifests when his ambassadors follow him faithfully and proclaim his word. Armor, here meaning weapons, refers to the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. In physical combat, the right hand normally attacks with a sword and the left hand and the left defends with a shield. However, these are weapons of righteousness, the spiritual weapons that God supplies. Relying on God completely equips us with weapons of righteousness to cope with the attacks of the adversary from any quarter, right or left, and to send him fleeing. He says to resist the enemy continuously and he will flee. These comparisons give us an indication of, char of charges Paul's critics are leveling at him. Human response to Paul's preaching varies greatly, but God's estimate is positive regardless of the opinions of the people. Regardless, he continues to fight the good fight of faith. Paul 
continues to fight the good fight of faith. Moreover, regardless of how he appears to be doing to the people, God is preserving and blessing him. Appeal for restoration of the Corinthians' confidence in Paul. Paul's continuing to appeal to them that what he did was always in love and good faith toward them. Paul turns to a direct appeal for the Corinthians to reconcile with him in their hearts. He makes this appeal to inspire the Corinthians to accept him in his ministry, to continue to experience all the blessings that God wants them to have. And then he has an appeal for large-heartedness. In other words, open that heart up and consistency in everything they do. Verse 11, O oh, Corinthians, our mouth is open to you, speaking. Our heart is enlarged. You are not straightened. And the word straightened here literally means confined. Uh, straightened, of course, means to us other things, you know, standing straight or whatever. Confined means he's got them confined. Or you are not straightened, confined in us. But you are straightened in your own bowels. In, in other words, they're, all, they're spiritually constricting themselves. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as to children, be you also enlarged as our heart is enlarged. Based on his prior openness with the Corinthians, Paul exhorts them to respond toward him as he had behaved toward them. Paul's open mouth spoke of a heart that is wide with affection for these people. They had shown reserve not because Paul put them under bondage, but because they doubt his integrity. Blending frustration and affection, Paul hails the Corinthians and calls for them to respond with unrestrained love. Here it is his extreme candor to sharing the painful experiences of his ministry with his dear friends that moves him. Paul appeals strongly for them to reciprocate his openness and love completely. However, he knew that he could not demand this, but only request it as a parent requests the love of his children. Verse 14, be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? I need everyone to repeat this one with me, please. Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And that literally means friendships, close relationships, the whole nine yards. God knows those are hard, and he's going to talk about that a little more here in a second. And what concord, meaning agreement, has Christ with Belial? Belial meaning Satan. Or what part has he that believes in an, with an infidel, an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And I would like y'all to repeat this one with me as well. You can leave out the green words. And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We are his people. Paul commands. What he said was not a request. And he understands his authority under God as well as all ministers should understand their authority under God. That is a commandment. Paul commands the Christians form no binding interpersonal relationships with non-Christians that result in their spiritual defilement. You cannot be bonded to somebody that is an unbeliever and not be defiled. 
And if you think by being bonded to someone that is a, un, is a non-believer and believe that you can convert them, believe me, 90% of the time, the conversion is the other way. The darkness floods the light of the individual that's trying to shine the light on them. Such alliances can prevent the Christian from living a consistently obedient Christian life. The fulfill and it's hard enough as it is without having other people pulling us down with them. The fulfillment of God's will must be primary for the believer. There is a conceptual parallel here with what Jesus, Paul, and Peter taught about the believer's relationships with God and the state. We should obey both authorities unless they conflict, in which case we must obey God. When the state, the government, conflicts with what God has written, he makes it very plain in his word, and all these verses right here are talking about when the state conflicted with what God had to say, and they said very plainly, we will follow God even if it means going to jail. Christians should follow God's will that results in righteous behavior. Pagans have no regard for God's laws. Christians are children of light. Unbelievers are children of darkness. Christians are temples of the living God and are quite different from the heathen who worship idols in temples made with hands. And temples doesn't necessarily mean uh, buildings. Temples made with hands is talking about these false little things that they carve out of wood or that they carve out of stone, these false idols that they make. Those are temples made with hands that they think is their God and that's who they worship. Quite different from the heathen who worship idols in temples made with hands. The main reason for Paul's prohibition is that Christians belong to Christ. To attempt to affiliate with unbelievers is treason against the Lord. Paul is very strong about how he feels about the way people treat God's grace. He's very strong about that, as well as we all should be. Paul taught the Corinthians that they are the temple of God. Therefore, it is only appropriate that they be set apart to God, too, since he inhabits them. Another Old Testament quotation is from Exodus 6-7 and Leviticus 26-12. The essential relationship between God and the people that he has chosen for special blessing requires that those so blessed remain faithful to him. The counterbalancing caution. Now this ends in, in actually in chapter uh, 7 verse 1. Somehow or another the reason why that verse got put over in chapter 7 I don't know. The Corinthians tend to respond to Paul's teachings by first resisting them and then going completely overboard and applying them inappropriately. They did this in the dealing with the incestuous man, for example, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Consequently, Paul explains what he did not mean by his appeal so that they will not become dangerously open-hearted to all people. In other words, accepting anybody that wants to come in. You know, there's a reason why it's called the sanctuary. The sanctuary is for, Christ, is for God's people to be able to come in and worship him in truth and spiritually if you've got unbelievers in there as well and you've got all kinds of other people that come in and I believe me I've been in a church where they invite Indians that uh, believe in the spirit gods uh, they invite all kinds of people that come in there and they literally come in believing that well this is just in addition to my other gods This created such a discord in that church that there was continuous splits going on in the church all the time because people couldn't figure out exactly where it was that the pastor stood on Jesus. Is he the only way? Yes, he is the only way. 
So there isn't anything else that can be accepted in any way, shape, or form. Consequently, Paul explains what he did not mean by his appeal, so they will not become dangerously open-hearted to all people. This section of text summarizes 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 22, where Paul previously warned the Corinthians about idolatry. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be you separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean, here meaning impure, touch not the impure, and I will receive you, and will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate. That doesn't mean haughty. He wants you to be separate from them. Not to look down on them like they're something pathetic. That's not his intention. But he does want you to be separate from them because they will, because they will look on you as being something pathetic. Which is fine. They want to look on you as being something that is not right. Because in the world, you're supposed to get out and be able to party and have a good time. And partying and having a good time is not against God's will. The way they want to party and have a good time usually is against God's will. So we have a different way of living, and they don't like it. They think you're becoming a nun or a monk or something like that. No, no, no such thing happening here. I don't live like a monk. I live like a farmer, rancher however you want to call it. And I have a good time out there. It's fun watching chickens fight each other every once in a while. <laughs> it's probably not fun for them. We usually have to pull the roosters out and separate them. But he, sa he says right here, it said, Wherefore come out from among them and be you separate, said the Lord. Not Paul, not Jerry. Not Mingo, the Lord said it. And touch not the unclean, which means impure, anything that's impure, whether it be people, things, or industries. And I will receive you, and will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. You will be God's sons and daughters. Said God, not Mingo, not Jerry, not Paul. God said you will be his sons and daughters. Having therefore these promises, dearly, and this is Paul speaking, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, he's not saying that you're going to be able to become perfect while here on this earth. That's impossible. Paul quoted from Isaiah 52, 11, where God calls his people to separate, depart from Babylon and its idolatry. He applies this to the Corinthian situation in which unbelievers practiced idolatry. And we have unbelievers all over this city that practice all kinds of idolatry. If you think idolatry is not here in San Antonio or the surrounding areas, you're blind and need to open your eyes. These are God's plain instructions to his people concerning separation from evil. Christians are not to stay in the heart of it as part of it in order to remedy it. God's program is come out. The unclean in this verse is primarily the heathen world, but it, all, it also applies to any form of evil, whether commercial, social, or religious. Yes, there is evil in churches that claim to be Christian. This final mosaic quotation advances the revelation concerning Christians' relationship to God. He is not only our God who is holy, but he is our Father. It is often very hard for Christians to sever ties that have existed for years in order to be obedient to the word of God. 
God anticipates such difficulty in verse 18. He already said in verse 17, I will receive you. And now he adds, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The recompense for standing with Christ outside the camp of evil is to know fellowship with Father in a new and more intimate way, which is what God wants. He wants a relationship. Having the promises of intimate fellowship with God for obedience, Christians should avoid apparent sources of spiritual contamination. These sources of contamination can be external or internal in relation to heathens, places, or things. Instead, we should press on in our struggle against sin while having reverentially, while having reverentially fearing God or feared God. This verse stresses what we must do to progress in practical sanctification, and it reminds us that this process is endless. You don't stop try, uh, working on your sanctification. It's a daily exercise, kind of like your faith. Faith is a muscle. If you don't exercise your faith, it's going to get weak. The problem abounds on every hand today among evangelical Christians in liberal and neo-orthodox churches. They are continually asking, what shall I do? God's answer is found here. They should leave a fellowship where the Lord Jesus is not honored and exalted as God's well-beloved Son and the Savior of the world. They can do more for God outside such a fellowship than they ever will accomplish inside of it. Paul in no way suggests that it is possible to become perfectly holy while still here on the earth. Practical sanctification is a progression that goes on throughout our lifetime. We grow in likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ until the day when we see him face to face and then we shall be like him throughout all eternity. It is as we have a reverential fear or awe of God that we have a desire in our hearts to become holy. May we all learn to say on a daily basis, Lord make me as holy as it is possible for a man to be on this side of heaven. Lord, make me as holy as it is possible for a man to be, or a woman, however you want to say it, on this side of heaven. Amen? Any questions? Well, that's all right. Paul always has good messages our job is to listen and learn and know what it is that he's trying to get through to us. The Holy Spirit is the one doing the talking actually. Paul was just being obedient and writing it down.